This episode is brought to you in part by Pittsburgh Seminary's Henderson Leadership Conference, September 22nd to 24th with Dr. Diana Butler-Bass. Attend in person or online for lectures and workshops with strategies for ministry amid political and theological divisions. Visit www.pts.edu slash Henderson. This episode is brought to you by Our Daily Bread Ministries, a global media organization that makes the life-changing wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to all. Visit whereyou'refrom.org for more information. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. This is the first episode in a series on the American West and its relationship with evangelicalism. The stuff we're covering here is going to be important in the next few episodes. Normally, Truce involves a lot of edits and music, but I think this episode functions best as an interview. Enjoy. I live in the American West. Sagebrush, mountains, horses, and yes, tumbleweeds. This is an area defined by legends. Some of them are true, and some of them are not. I used to work for the History Museum here in Jackson, Wyoming. My favorite local story went something like this. It was the 1920s, and prohibition was in full force. Alcohol was totally illegal. Still, someone brought some over Teton Pass in a horse-drawn wagon and down into what is now the town square. Today, it's a bustling tourist attraction with arches made of antlers and gift shops where you can buy $50 t-shirts and designer coffee. Back then, they literally grazed cows on the town square. Again, it was illegal to consume alcohol. So a group of friends sneaked into a multi-seat outhouse. Today, it's where the Wells Fargo Bank is on the town square. They thought they were being sneaky. They took the cap off the bottle and passed it around, each person taking a swig. (laughs) Trouble is, they crammed too many people into the outhouse. They heard a sharp cracking sound, and the floor gave out, sending all of them into the mess below. Legend has it that they forgot to cover the hole left by the collapsed outhouse and a cow fell in. Supposedly, the milk never tasted the same afterwards. That is a Western legend. There's no way to know if it's true, but it always gets a laugh around the campfire. Of course, there are other legends about the West out there. Some that carry a lot more weight than that of a collapsed outhouse. Like, say, changing a belief system and even getting presidents elected. You're listening to the show that uses journalistic tools to look inside the Christian church. We press pause in the culture wars in order to explore how we got here and how we can do better. I'm Chris Starin, and this is Truce. This episode is brought to you by No Small Endeavor, the acclaimed podcast from Great Feeling Studios and PRX. In each episode, host and award-winning theologian Lee C. Camp sits down with courageous and impassioned people, like Hollywood legend Rob Reiner and civil rights hero Reverend James Lawson, talking about what it means to find true happiness and flourish in day-to-day life. And if you're looking for somewhere to start, why not check out the recent episode with award-winning journalist and best-selling author Tim Alberta on Christian nationalism's role in the Republican Party. Follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. One of the prominent myths out there is that of the American cowboy. The next few episodes are going to circle around this myth and the way that we see it in American evangelicalism. To start off, I thought I'd talk to the author of a really popular book. I'm Kristen Cobus dume and the book is Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. And I am a professor of history and gender studies at Calvin University. I think that I may be the last Christian podcaster to have interviewed you. <laughs> right. Yes, but this is a different one. This is going in some different directions. So It's true. Basically, everyone else has interviewed her, but I think that her book is the perfect way to start this series on the American West. In that book, you bring up all these different characters that reoccur in men's ministry, and having been in men's ministry for a long time, I've seen this a lot. Uh, So characters like 
William Wallace, uh, the noble soldier. And another one that comes up is the, the myth of the cowboy, the idea that men should be like cowboys. I, I thought it would be kind of fun to say, like, what what do you think of when you think of a cowboy? Mm. You're asking a historian this question. Uh, it's <laughs> almost like a trick question. <laughs> so when you know when I think of the cowboy, when I when I when I come across a mention of a cowboy, certainly in in popular literature and religious literature, I think of a hero. Right? I think of a solitary hero uh, out west somewhere. Uh, a gun in his holster, wearing the the traditional cowboy hat, rugged, uh, brave, and uh, you know, kind of the the quiet type, but a man who is not afraid to do what needs to be done. Right, maybe a little bit of a lover. Uh, that's another one of those things. Yes, that, yeah. yes, romantic uh, interest certainly. Of you know, a kind of heartthrob and and the, just this this model of heroic, rugged masculinity. That's probably close to what you imagine when you think of the cowboy. In the next episode, we're going to pull that idealized, rugged individual apart. See how it holds up historically. But first, let's talk about how that legend has shaped American evangelicalism. It's a, a kind of long and winding trail that, that gets us there. But um, uh, in, in my own research, I really end up centering in the post-war era, post-World War II, Cold War America, to understand American evangelicalism um, and the kind of emergence of a modern evangelicalism that we'd recognize today. And um, right Right at the, the heart of that story is this elevation of a heroic um, um, Christian manhood. And, and so the Cold War context is, is key here. Season three of this podcast was about how the rise of communism shaped the American Christian church. And just because we're now in season four doesn't mean we're not going to talk about communism because it really shaped who we are today. Uh, in the Cold War, we had uh, a real threat in communism. And uh, Americans were concerned, and American evangelicals in particular were concerned because communism was seen as anti-God, anti-American, and anti-family. And so those are all the things that conservative evangelicals held dear. And so to fight against communism, they needed to protect kind of pure Orthodox Christianity, preserve uh, American Christianity, and, and they understood that they were the, the, the best guardians of Orthodox Christianity as evangelicals, and they needed to defend Christian America from external threats. And so we needed strong men, strong men who could defend faith, family, and nation. And, and so all these values kind of um, came together neatly, Christian nationalism, quote unquote, traditional masculinity, and the, the understanding that God ordained men and, and prepared men by filling them with testosterone to protect, um, uh, to protect the church and to protect the nation. Um, so, so you have these ideals already kind of um, operative in terms of evangelical identity. And then you bring in the uh, myth of the American cowboy, which not coincidentally was really gaining in popularity right during this early Cold War era. This was the the rise of the, the kind of heyday of the American Western and in television and then in movies. And this tapped into the same um, the, the same kind of ideals, the same fears, the same longings, the, the fact that we needed heroic American uh, protectors, American men, um, good guys versus bad guys, and that we we were drawing on this tradition of who we were, who we are at our best, and we need that that militant American hero to protect us on the global stage. Two of the main players in the book, uh, both were instrumental in calling out communism in, in the public sphere. So John Wayne and Ronald Reagan. Uh, how were those two guys involved in calling out communism? And obviously, both of them had kind of a cowboy image to them. Yes, yes, they they um, they both played the cowboy, and uh, and certainly um, came to symbolize this this kind of rugged cowboy masculinity. And, and part of that was uh, not being afraid to um, say what need, needed to be said, and, and again do what needed to be done, um, and presented themselves as such. And so uh, John Wayne was, um, you know, you think of him 
on screen. Um, and, and that's really, I think, his most important role is this symbol, this icon of conservative American um, manhood. So not only did he play the cowboy and he really, you know, rose to stardom by being this cowboy hero, uh, but he also um, came to symbolize kind of the um, the American soldier at his best, even though he himself did not uh, serve in the military. Uh, some of his his greatest films uh, were uh, where he played war heroes. And so we have the Sands of Iwo Jima. And, and that's really fascinating, the kind of backstory there, where it's actually modeled on a character that he played in. Red River on an actual cowboy. And then they just like bring this cowboy heroism out uh, to, you know, World War II battlefields. And then he has that heroism from the Good War and the cowboy combined, this cowboy soldier hero. And then he takes that into uh, the battlefields of Vietnam, right? (laughs) Where he can, he can take that kind of Good War, um, uh, uh, aura and, and, uh, kind of rewrite the Vietnam war to make it more palatable, to make it fit this heroic narrative over against reality. And, and that's in the green berets. And, and so on screen, he plays this role, um, but, but, uh, off, off screen as well. He's, uh, leading, uh, a figure in Hollywood, kind of anti-communist crusades and, um, um, by the 1960s, he is very active in um, in politics regionally and nationally in Southern California, and he's supporting folks like Barry Goldwater and Phyllis Schlafly, and then eventually Ronald Reagan as well. So he's an interesting figure in what he symbolizes on screen and in his actual political activism and who he's connected to, political figures, and um, and both of these things, the the image, the icon, and the activism really do go hand in hand. He was part of the House on American Activities Committee as well. Yes, yes. And um, and so he um, his Cold War activism started early on and it was connected uh, to his his role in Hollywood as well. So so he um, he comes by this anti-communism very honestly and and was a leading figure um, from from very early on in the 1940s already. And and so then there's also Ronald Reagan who also played a cowboy. And as we know, would later go on to play a big role in shaping conservative politics and also um, sort of the moral majority movement. Uh, can you can you speak to how Ronald Reagan? kind of gets tied up into this. Yeah. So Ronald Reagan too uh, played the cowboy on screen uh, and also in kind of embodied just the way he carried himself by the 1970s and and well, you know, into the 1980s as this this rub, rugged cowboy figure. So uh, he bought he bought his California ranch uh, right when he became governor of California in the 1970s. And he loved to be photographed out there and, uh, you know, with his cowboy hat and on horseback. Um, so he, he too, conveyed this image of rug, rugged American manhood. Um, but this also for him dovetailed very nicely with his politics as he you know, switched from the uh, Democratic Party to the Republican Party, as he increasingly embraced the politics of the right over the course of the 70s. Uh, it, it, it fit together so nicely because uh, he, he embraced an aggressive foreign policy um, and particularly over against what he saw as the failures of the, the Carter administration in the 70s. And um, he promised to bring uh, American strength back again, to to revitalize American strength on the world stage, to take on communists. And that was this, um, precisely what evangelicals loved about him and why they uh, ended up um, supporting him over uh, Jimmy Carter in the 1980 election, one of one of many reasons, uh, but he certainly seemed uh, the the um, antidote to what they perceived to be Carter's weaknesses, his failures of of courage, failures of masculinity on the global stage as well as domestically. And so Ronald Reagan just came strolling in, and um, he he really fit the image, it, you know, just kind of right right out of. Um, um, central casting, really, and and then he backed it up with his words, and um, um, and then uh, on the at least in terms of his foreign policy, um, with his um, with his policies as well. Yeah. And both of those guys seem like really unlikely heroes for evangelicals, um, people who are generally very much about following biblical morals and things. How how did John Wayne and Ronald Reagan match up to Christian? 
beliefs in morality in their personal lives. Yeah, not so well. Not yeah. so well. <laughs> it seems it seems like a weird match. Yeah. So, you know, John Wayne, um, several marriages, uh, three marriages, uh, you know, um, haunted by stories of abuse and um, carried on several high profile uh, affairs, a drinker, a smoker back when smoking was kind of a moral issue. And, uh, you know, definitely not the poster boy of quote unquote family values. Um, and you know, worth, worth stating, he also was not an evangelical <laughs> himself. And then Ronald Reagan, right, also not um, not a poster boy of family values. He too was divorced. Uh, and uh, and uh, for, for a long time also, um, you know, he was a Democrat and he, he was somewhat liberal on issues of, uh, you know, women's rights and, and abortion and things like that. And so, um, but he, he really did end up transforming his, his image. And, um, uh, but in both cases, the affinities were not based on morality on on the personal life um, and evangelicals were able to overlook that because what they really admired was uh, the way both men really embodied their their cultural and political values that both men stood for uh you know quote unquote traditional masculinity almost this this retrograde masculinity um, which had um, had political and uh, cultural and religious significance by the 1970s. It was seen as a rejection of feminism, a rejection of liberalism, of all of these threats to Christian America, <clears throat> to traditional values. And so simply by embodying that rugged and um, no longer politically correct uh, masculinity, if you will, they sent a message of what they stood for and what they stood against. And that's where we see um, the affinities between conservative evangelicals and um, somebody like John Wayne and Ronald Reagan. And it's important to emphasize that, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, what they, um, what drew them to these figures um, was not necessarily in contradiction, absolute contradiction to family values evangelicalism. On the surface, it certainly seems like it is. Um, but if you look at what actually constituted family values um, politics for white evangelicals historically, we have to locate at the core of family values was uh, the assertion of white patriarchal authority. And when you put that at the center, then you can see there are some continuities here as well as some disconnects. And because both John Wayne and Ronald Reagan embodied this assertion, this unapologetic assertion of white patriarchal authority. And that's where you can see the connection. There are a few different times you mentioned folks who um, disagree with this sort of form of masculinity in Christianity. And there are some some really interesting uh, debates going on about what Christian masculinity looks like because uh, Jesus says, you know, to turn the other cheek, to love your neighbor, um, to, you know, give to people. If, if somebody asks you for your, you know, uh, what is it for your shirt, you give them your coat as well. Uh, so like going the extra mile. And these things seem to rub up against the idea of the rugged masculinity where it's like, get what's yours and fight to protect your stuff. Um, what is sort of that uh, debate uh, on the other side? What does that look like? Yeah, you're right. So uh, if you look at uh, the scriptures and you know the Bible, it's 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 a complicated set of texts. Yeah. So you know, we have centuries now of of Christians uh, seeking to understand to interpret these texts. So uh, that's probably a, a good place to start with that reminder. But um, in the scriptures you do see a lot of, of teachings, particularly from, um, from Jesus in the New Testament, that would seem to contradict this uh, rugged, aggressive um, model of masculinity. Jesus, uh, time and again, surprises his followers because he disrupts their notions of power, disrupts their notions of, of what a Messiah looks like what a Messiah came to do. And instead, he offers this, um, this 
very countercultural model of divesting himself of power. Of you know, we have the beatitudes and and uh, the the fruit of the spirit. And so, what is the evidence of the Christian life? It is you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self control. And that's that's not really what we're talking about when we're looking at this this rugged cowboy um, freedom fighting masculinity. And 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 that's kind of the point here. That's why evangelicals have looked outside their tradition, have looked to men like uh, John Wayne, like Ronald Reagan, uh, we could also say like Donald Trump, men who have not been deeply shaped by traditional Christian values. Now, I should say Ronald Reagan did grow up as a Christian, and so that we could complicate that one a little bit. But if we just go with John Wayne and, and Donald Trump, right, men who um, have not clearly been formed by these countercultural values. And that's where they go to find this model and then import that into Christianity and uphold these figures, warriors, cowboys, soldiers, as models of Christian manhood. What we see happening then is in order to bring these in, uh, in alignment with the Bible and, and with Jesus, they end up transforming Jesus himself into a warrior, into a rugged fighter. You can see somebody like Mark Driscoll doing this very explicitly, where his Jesus is a warrior with tattoos down his leg, riding a horse, wielding a bloody sword, and charging into battle to slay his enemies. And so what happens is uh, they end up embracing this uh, largely secular cultural ideal of masculinity and then using that to transform their idea of Christ, their idea of Christianity to bring it in alignment. Yeah. And in some ways, you can kind of see where that would be politically expedient in the era of communism, um, to try to pull people away from collectivism of communism and socialism and push them towards an individualistic idea. And also, you kind of want them to be mobilized for war. And it's hard to mobilize a turn-the-other-cheek person uh, to go shoot at somebody. <laughs> um, it is. So you could see how it would be politically expedient, but it does, it does really rub up against the biblical Jesus. It does. It, it is politically expedient, uh, both you know in terms of kind of national politics. It's also expedient in terms of mobilizing supporters on a on a smaller scale. In terms of you know pastors building um, little religious empires. In terms of organizations in the religious right, you know mobilizing out of out of you know kind of stoking up fear and calling on people to to act to fight um, because the the threat looms large. It's a very effective um, uh, tool of mobilization. Then you also noted this this individualism, right? And and I think that's worth coming back to because it's not just politically expedient, but it also is consistent with uh, some um, kind of tendencies of evangelical theology too, right? Because evangelicals historically have emphasized the role of the individual. That is an individual uh, who hears the call of God, who is converted, right? Who, whose soul is saved. And this focus on individual conversion and then individual action. And so now you respond accordingly uh, because you are born again really uh, is it goes against much of the history of Christianity, uh, which which tends to focus more on tradition, on uh, institutions, on, uh, you know, if, if you look at the, the history of Catholicism, for example, or even uh, just denominational um, um, identities within uh, American history, um, much more of a collective focus. But evangelicalism has always focused um, on this individual kind of heart conversion version. And so the individualism within the theology uh, kind of uh, dovetails with, reinforces this um, broader individualism. And that's, too, what the cowboy really symbolizes, like this lone ranger, right? Yeah. One man out uh, on, on, on the frontier, and, and it, it's all up to him. It's up to him to preserve uh, order and to pursue righteousness. And so that, that really does resonate with some of evangelicalism's uh, theological tendencies as well. The second half of the book really started to resonate with me as it came into the, time, the era where I 
personally experienced it, uh, including uh, books on men's ministry, like those written by John Eldridge um, with Wild at Heart. Can you can you tell us a little bit about Wild at Heart and John Eldridge and his philosophy? Yeah, John Eldridge's Wild at Heart is the book that that really uh, started uh, this whole project oh, for really? me, and that led to my own Jesus and John Wayne. Yes, I. Um, so I uh, was a new professor at Calvin uh, back in 2005 or 2006, it was, and I was teaching a, a survey course in U.S. history and decided to introduce my students one day to Teddy Roosevelt and um, particularly focusing on Roosevelt's masculinity. I wanted to show my students how gender worked in history, um, how ideas of masculinity change over time, how they're linked to uh, broader economic shifts and religion and also race and foreign policy and American empire. And of course, Teddy Roosevelt is just this perfect example, kind of set piece. And so I, I gave the lecture. I was impressed, thought it went well. And then after class, a couple of guys came up to me and said, Professor Dumay, there's this book that you have to read. And that was John Eldridge's Wild at Heart. Now, at that time, that book was already this phenomenal bestseller. It would go on to sell more than 4 million copies. And I'd heard all about it, just wasn't my thing, wasn't interested, <laughs> but I took their advice. I picked one up at my local Christian bookstore. And uh, sure enough, I opened the book and, and, and it, it, it starts right off with a quote from Teddy Roosevelt. And Eldridge goes on to sketch this um, vision of you know, Christian masculinity very much um, in line with Roosevelt's model. So very militant, militaristic conception of what it is to be a Christian man. Uh, for Eldridge, God is a warrior God and men are made in his image. Every man has a battle to fight and a beauty to rescue. And what struck me immediately when I read that book is, uh, you know, evangelicals self-identify as Bible-believing Christians. You know, first and foremost, they are Christians who uphold the authority of the scriptures and apply that in all of life. And yet, when I read this book, what really struck me was, you know, how little Eldridge was really drawing on the scriptures and how much he was looking to Hollywood, Hollywood heroes, um, to Mel Gibson's William Wallace from the movie Braveheart, to, you know, random cowboys, to soldiers, to General Patton, General MacArthur. And, um, and then I thought, you know, what, what's really going on here? And just like historians had examined Teddy Roosevelt in the early 20th century, you know, understanding how his his vision of masculinity was linked to foreign policy, was linked to American empire, was linked to race, and um, and, and white supremacy. I um, I saw that in again, this was around 2005 or 2006. This was the early years of the Iraq War. And at that same time that I was reading this literature on this militant Christian masculinity, I was seeing all this survey data come in that white evangelicals were far and away more likely to support the Iraq war, to support preemptive war in general, to condone the use of torture, to embrace a really aggressive foreign policy more likely than any other Americans. And so I just started to ask the same question of, um, of El Eldridge's work. And by this time, because of its popularity, it had spawned this copycat industry, right? There are dozens of books that that really like take from almost the exact same cast of characters, William Wallace, General Patton, General MacArthur, cowboys, um, heroes. And, and this was very much a thing throughout white evangelical at the time. And so I just started to ask, you know, uh, what might one of these have to do with the other? And, and that really is the, the origin story of Jesus and John Wayne. I, I remember reading that book myself. And uh, one of the things that stuck out with me, I, I mean, I haven't read it in 20 years, maybe. Yeah. It's been a long time. But I, I still remember there's a section where it talks about if your son is being bullied, you should encourage him to punch the bully. To fight. To fight. Yes. Yeah, and not turn the other cheek. <laughs> no, no, yeah. and and the, these this literature, right? It, and Eldridge isn't the first one to come up with this. Uh, it's 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 the bestseller. Um, but what I when I looked back to history, I saw that this was consistent advice offered. You know, since the 1970s, at least by evangelicals, how to raise boys. You know, you got to teach them to fight. Uh, you know, and another book that that came out around the same time um, as uh, as Eldridge's Doug Wilson's Future Men. He actually called for a theology of fist fighting. 
but you know very important is that no no you don't you can't uh have a a a boy grow into be the kind of man that we need him to be we christians we americans by teaching him to turn the other cheek and so they literally took you know the words of scripture and said nah don't do this this time calls for something different yeah I, and I do understand the the Bible is a, a very large, very complex book written over a lot of years. And there are wars in the Old Testament where mm-hmm. God tells people to go and slaughter another group of people. And then you meet Jesus in the New Testament and he says, turn the other cheek. And then the end of the New Testament is another war. Revelation. Right. <laughs> And so if you're, uh, that's the Jesus that uh, writers on evangelical masculinity are drawn to, the Jesus of the book of Revelation, Uh, the Jesus that, uh, again, you know, there's blood and there's swords and there's horses and there's violence. But the book of Revelation, I mean, if we say the Bible's complicated, the book of Revelation even more so. You know, critics have, have have pointed to the significance that the sword is coming out of Jesus's mouth. And so there's some symbol there. And but uh, that's really the um uh the the favorite Jesus, you know, a little bit the the flip the tables Jesus right. uh in, in the temple, but very much the Jesus of the book of Revelation, which um fits very well this this model that they've already cast. Um, of, of a warrior, um, a warrior hero. And, and so they can find justification for violence um, and their own violence in the book of Revelation. And so, I mean, they'll say things like, you know, sure, um, there's um, a, a kind of eschatological pacifism. So you know, Jesus comes to bring peace, but only after he slays all his enemies, right? That's where the right. book of Revelation comes in. So the peace, well, that's a long ways off. Jesus is p- peacemaker. Uh, right now, we're in the thick of the battle and we need to fight right alongside him. Or and what that turns into is we're going to fight and claim that Jesus is alongside of us. Right. It, this is such an interesting counterbalance to what I I, uh, I see you being taught to women um, yes. in women's ministry. Um, I, I haven't seen this kind of aggression in women's ministry. It's usually that they focus on the gentle Jesus for women and then the revelation Jesus for men. Yes. Has that been your experience? <laughs> Yes, uh, very much. So much so that I, like so many other Christian women, kind of gave up on the whole women's Bible study yeah. experience long, long ago, you know, with the pink floral Bibles and uh, <laughs> and such. I mean, even if you look at Eldridge's work, you know, I said, uh, he said, every man has a battle to fight and a beauty to rescue. And he's very clear that a woman's role is not to have her own adventure. It is to share in a man's adventure. Right. So she is the object, and and she is what needs to be uh, uh, rescued. And her role is seductive, not fierce. And you can you can probably hear how this is somewhat problematic. And this too, as as I I, I went into the the historical sources, saw that Eldridge isn't inventing this either. There's a long history of this kind of teaching uh, in evangelicalism that women are to be feminine, women are to be beautiful, they are to be seductive, they are to meet their husbands sexual needs, even their aggressive sexual needs, that is what God designed them to do. They are to submit religiously, socially, and sexually to their husbands. And and so this is a, a, a there is a long history of these kinds of teachings in uh, evangelical churches, in Christian publishing. And so what that looks like for women is, um, yeah, a very passive role, not usurping a man's authority, not um, leading, not being courageous, not being, um, certainly not being heroic, right? It's always to share in a man's adventure. And um, I think that's uh, been a very problematic model of Christian womanhood for many reasons. Uh, I think it has set women up um, to um, uh, it, it's contributed to a culture of abuse in many uh, Christian circles. It's made it difficult for women to recognize abuse, uh, to uh, to to call that out, and um, but it's also, I think, even more commonly made a lot of women feel like they can't be real Christians, that they aren't good Christians, because that's not who they are. Uh, they, that doesn't fit with how how. 
God actually made them. And in fact, that happens with men too. I've heard from so many men, both when I was researching this book and since the book has come out, telling me how much they struggled with this ideal of heroic masculinity because it did not fit who they were. They didn't want to go, you know, um, uh, rock climbing on the weekend into a weekend warrior retreat. They'd rather go to an art museum maybe, but that was just wasn't an option. Right. And so a lot of men felt like um, second class Christians felt like there was something wrong with them or felt like the church just wasn't for them. Right. Boy, that is destructive. Um, even preaching two different Jesuses to two different group of people. Um, that is is very weird. <laughs> it is, right? And two different sets of virtues. That's another thing. I mentioned the the fruit of the spirit before and and how, you know, these were not the ingredients of Christian masculinity, um, especially things like gentleness and self-restraint. And so what we see happening is the sorting out of Christian virtues. And so men get the courage and men get the heroism and men get the, the action and the leadership. And then women get the self-restraint and women get the gentleness and women get the love. And, and you can see how that's destructive on both sides, right? It's destructive because it, it leaves women very vulnerable. And it's destructive to men because, uh, you know, arguably, um, you know, the, the model of what it looks like to follow Christ uh, and the fruit of the Spirit ought to apply to men as well. And if it doesn't, uh, you know, things can get, get ugly uh, rather quickly. Yeah. But I think those ideas help us connect the dots between evangelicalism and the rise of Donald Trump. I, I, one of the questions I got the most um, as I've traveled around, uh, is how can evangelicals support somebody like Donald Trump? Um, and But I think I, we can see that inside what we just talked about, where men are being taught that they should they need a fighter, somebody who's going to be relentless and not let up and never sway from their opinions. And women are taught that they need a protector. Yes. Um, can, you, can you maybe connect those dots for us? How, how do we get from John Wayne to Donald Trump? Yeah. So, you know, I, I mentioned that I first started uh, kind of looking into th these questions back in 2005 or 2006. And I um, spent about a year researching, immersing myself in all this literature on Christian masculinity. And then I ended up setting the project aside for a variety of reasons, but I didn't stop paying attention. And so I was I was following kind of the the careers of, of some of the men who were really promoting this militant Christian masculinity. And what I saw happening in the next decade was one after another of these guys became embroiled in scandals, uh, abuse of power, and frequently uh, sexual abuse, either directly as perpetrators or indirectly supporting friends of theirs who, who were. And, um, and so it was actually in the... Um, the days after the release of the Access Hollywood tape in 2016, October 2016, that suddenly things clicked for me. At that point, if you recall, um, white evangelicals were already um, you know, very much um, supporting uh, then-candidate Donald Trump. Um, but once that Access Hollywood tape released, the nation kind of stopped. This was just weeks before the 2016 election. And I mean, the, the big question was, what are white evangelicals going to do now? They cannot possibly support this man after this, right? These are family values evangelicals. This is the moral majority. You know, he's done for. But that's not what happened. A few prominent evangelicals ever so briefly wavered. Wayne Grudem was one of them. He rescinded his support for Trump, but then he decided to pray about it. And within a week later, he, uh, he was back supporting Trump. Most evangelicals didn't even waver. And that's when it clicked for me. I thought, we have seen this before. We have seen this so many times within evangelical churches, within evangelical organizations, where the evangelical community uh, protects and supports and very, very quickly and easily forgives abusers, abusers of power and sexual abusers in their own circles. And, and I noticed how the language that I was hearing evangelicals use to describe their support for Trump sounded exactly like what I had read in this literature on Christian manhood, that um, he was their protector. He would do what needed to be done. He was 
uncowed by political correctness. He, um, you know, he was he was not going to be um, bound by notions of civility or politeness. Uh, he was, in their words, their ultimate fighting champion, or as Robert Jeffress put it, you know, the, um, uh, what we need right now is the strongest, meanest SOB. And, and that's who Donald Trump is. And, and that's what he's going to do for us. He's going to protect Christianity. And that's exactly what Donald Trump said he would do. I will protect Christianity. And, and again, the, the similarities in the rhetoric around uh, Donald Trump and what I had read in this literature were just impossible to ignore. And we had evangelical support like Michelle Bachman uh, calling Trump, uh, you know, he would he would return us to a John Wayne America riding tall in the saddle, and so you actually hear that language as well, and um, uh, that made me under or led me to see in uh, the wake of the 2016 election when we when we saw that notorious figure of 81 percent, according to uh, exit polls, 81 percent of white evangelicals who did end up voting for Donald Trump, despite everything. The uh, media at the time and some evangelical leaders, you know, asked this question, how could evangelicals betray their values to vote for a man like Donald Trump? And I knew that that wasn't the right question, that we just didn't fully understand what those values were. And if you understand this longer history of evangelical masculinity, of the assertion of white patriarchal authority, then you can see this was not the betrayal of their values. In many ways, this vote for Trump fulfilled those values that they held dear. Right. And how have you seen things change uh, after mm. Donald Trump left office, ha- what are you seeing in evangelicalism? I haven't seen a lot of evidence of change, but uh, you know, there's just not as much to see right mm-hmm. now. When you know, f- during the four years that Trump was in office, he just really controlled the the, um, the narrative in many ways. He just defined the narrative. He he was constantly. In the news, you know, every tweet, every day, it was this this barrage, and so there was a lot more that people could react to, and and so it was a little bit more visible what kind of response. And what I saw in those four years was, uh, uh, you know, very little remorse. That's what I was initially looking for. Like, okay, okay, you vanquished Hillary Clinton. You know that that's uh, it, we don't have to worry about that anymore for white evangelicals. Um, and Donald Trump, your protector, is in office. Uh, what comes next? You know, is, is there going to be any, um, any, any um, second thoughts? Uh, is there going to be any, um, okay, thanks for that, you know, to Trump, but now, you know, keep him in check? Very little. What we saw was the loyalty um, actually increase mm-hmm. and um, uh, over those four years. And then we saw very little movement in the white evangelical vote, depending on, on which polls you're looking at, maybe a few Um, percentage points, but maybe not still within the margin of error in terms of white evangelical support for Trump four years out. And so the support has been very consistent. Since he left office, I am not seeing any uh, vocal regret from any of his evangelical supporters. Um, I'm not seeing any real change of heart. The voices who are speaking out against him and his agenda are those that were doing so the last four years and most um, also had done so, you know, leading up to the 2016 election. Um, what is interesting to me, though, is uh, how how Trump himself, um, um, what, what might change, I should say, is that Trump no longer has the power that he had, obviously, right? He's not in the Oval Office anymore. Uh, he doesn't even uh, have t- access to Twitter. And what had so attracted evangelicals to him was his power that he promised to wield on their behalf. And so although I don't see any regret um, to speak of, really, I I don't see much decline in in that um, loyalty to this larger political agenda. I don't see real decline in loyalty towards Trump, but I just don't hear as much about it. I'm curious if as the, the months and then years go on, whether or not he, as this charismatic figure, 
can't help but fade because he no longer wields the power on um, behalf of evangelicals. So that would be one thing that I'm looking for. But um, as of now, I haven't seen any dramatic changes within um, uh, his evangelical supporters. What I do see is a lot of people who were deeply ambivalent then and over the last four years now starting to speak out more boldly. Mm. Well, and you get to speak to a lot of um, especially young people uh, in your job and doing podcasts and speaking. Um, it seems like there are a lot of folks who have been really shaken uh, in this era. And um, and I, I think your book addresses a lot of those core issues. Uh, what, do you, what do you say to people who, as a professor at a Christian university? Uh, what do you say to people who are finding that their faith is shaken um, at this time? Yeah, I think that... Um... I think the crisis is felt more poignantly by people who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Mm. Right? My students who come in are have not been as deeply formed. I mean, generally, <laughs> they're young, um, but they've not been as deeply formed by this um, by this uh, kind of cultural and political ideal. I don't think the evangelical subculture has the same hold on the the younger generation. You know, this is a generation that's on TikTok and, you know, Netflix binging. And they're, um, you know, the story telling Jesus and John Wayne is a story of, it's, it's a cultural history. It's a history of evangelical popular culture as it shapes evangelical ideals in terms of politics and uh, religion. And I just, I don't see that same hold on young Christians today that it had on people of my generation. So I came of age in the 80s and 90s, Mm. and the evangelical subculture was a thing. You know, I only listened to Christian music. I only shopped at a Christian bookstore, right? Um, That's just not the case so much anymore. But it's, it's those who are in there, especially in their 30s and 40s, I think that Jesus and John Wayne is really connecting with um, because they grew up in in this um, in this culture. And the story that I hear, because I have received so many hundreds of letters from from readers since this book came out, and almost all of them say, this is the story of my life. And then they they give me paragraphs and paragraphs to describe it, which is you know just fascinating to me. And they tell me about the promise keepers rallies that they went to. And some actually send pictures of their bookshelves and all the books <laughs> that I write about are on there. And then they say, but I had no idea, right? I never saw how all these pieces fit together. And so what's happening is they're taking their personal experience now and realizing how it maps incredibly closely onto this larger national story. And, and, um, <laughs> And it's that's that's what's so deeply disturbing. For some, it does bring about a kind of crisis of faith, right. particularly I would say for evangelical leaders who um, are confronting their own complicity in perpetuating this um, ideology. I, I've talked with several, and it's it's. Um, it's hard for them to realize that maybe 30, 35 years of their ministry that they thought they were doing for God's glory and to spread the good news actually ended up contributing to this, and they see it now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is a crisis. And when I when I talk with some of those folks, you know, th- things that we talk about are um, you know making amends. Uh, what can you do now? Um, who have you harmed? Who have you excluded? Um, for other, uh, you know, others who haven't been leaders um still i'm i'm really uh, impressed i have to say maybe even surprised by how many just kind of ordinary uh evangelicals have taken that next step on their own from recognizing what they have been com- uh what they have participated in and then examining their own complicity and so many ask or, or say i had no idea but then they they ask that next really important question why didn't I? Mm-hmm. Right? How could I have missed this? And and that helps them to start to think about you know who they have ignored, uh, what they have consumed, <laughs> what they have, um, um, why they felt so comfortable when other people uh, were not comfortable, and the kind of the level of introspection that I'm encountering right now. Um, honestly, I I never expected, um, uh, and so. 
Uh, so I've been impressed with the way so many white evangelicals are receiving this book yeah. with great humility um, and um, and really, uh, I'd say another thing that surprised me is that this book is now traveling along some of those same circuits that books like Eldridge's did 20 years ago. So, you know, Jesus and John Wayne is being read in men's groups in churches. <laughs> it's being read in pastors' groups, in church book clubs. And, uh, and, and that was something I also did not anticipate. And so evangelicals are coming together, or former evangelicals, and reading this book in the same way they read, you know, Aldridge's long ago, saying, how does this apply to me? And, and that's a- absolutely been fascinating to watch. Special thanks to Kristen Cobas Dumay. Her book again is Jesus and John Wayne and is well worth the read. If you read it, let me know on social media or by emailing me at trucepodcast at yahoo.com. Truce is a listener supported show. Right now I'm juggling this project, a full time job, and several side gigs. I'd eventually like to do this show full time. If you'd like to be a part of this crazy unique project, visit trucepodcast.com slash donate. This is the first episode in a series on the American West. The next three episodes took me months and months to make. I traveled a thousand miles to gather recordings and dove deep into public records to bring you stories that you won't hear anywhere else. You really don't want to miss these next few episodes. Subscribe to the show in your podcasting app so you'll get every episode as it's released. And while you're there, leave a comment and a rating. God willing, we'll be back in two weeks with some really wild episodes exploring the American West and the myth of the cowboy. I'm Chris Steren, and this is Truce.